welcome to the Filmed Live Musicals podcast, a podcast about stage musicals that have been legally filmed and publicly distributed. The Filmed Live Musicals website contains information on nearly 200 musicals that have been captured live. Check it out at filmedlivemusicals.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to episode 21 of the Filmed Live Musicals podcast. My name is Louisa Lyons, and joining me today is James T. Lane, an actor, singer, dancer based in New York City. He has performed across the United States, on and off Broadway, the West End, and in film and television. His credits include the national tours of Jersey Boys, Cinderella, and Fame, the Broadway productions of Kiss Me Kate, King Kong, and Chicago, and both West End and Broadway productions of A Chorus Line and The Scottsboro Boys. During the pandemic, James has appeared on The Amber Ruffin Show, and in the past week, he debuted his one-man show, Triple Threat, a play that moves and sings. Welcome, James. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So delighted to have you on the show. So to start (laughs) with, what made you fall in love with musical theater? Oh, goodness. (laughs) What made me fall in love with it? Well, I went to an elementary school for the performing arts. My mother, we lived in a different neighborhood. And my the better school was in my grandmother's neighborhood. So we went, so she so we she enrolled me in that school because the neighborhood school that we were in, you know, it just wasn't, you know, it was known to be not a great school. And this elementary school had a performing arts program. It was actually desegregated with the performing arts program. It was a predominantly black school, but it had this magnet program, which, which, which was the arts. And so all people from all over the city, all walks of life could go. And, um, you know, I, I led the kindergarten class around in, in a Michael Jackson song, like, like one of the first days of, of, of kindergarten, you know, <laughs> just had to move. But, you know, the school was known for these, for these arts. So we couldn't wait to get to first grade. First grade had Miss Shepard's uh, dance class where we had to like make sure our nails were clean and wear white shirts and black tights. And, you know, and she, you could smell that perfume across the, like down the halls, you know, she was the queen, you know, and you wanted to be a part of whatever she was doing. So that was, you know, and, and, and we were exposed to like the whiz and like, you know, cast albums and stuff like that. But it really kind of took a hold. I guess I was about nine or 10 where I went to, the Forest Theater in Philadelphia, and there was a touring production of The Phantom of the Opera. And I was with my godparents. I had never seen like a Broadway show or Broadway type show before. And um, I was sitting right under the chandelier as it fell. And, you know, I was like, ah, screamed out. And, you know, and then I was like, oh my goodness, like this is like a thing that you could do, you know? And then I found out that Robert Guillaume was uh, from this TV show called Benson. Benson, he was a black man. He was like um, like the, the lieutenant governor of, of whatever fictitious city they were in. And, um, but he was a Broadway, like a beautiful, you know, tenor voice. And um, he was the phantom in the, the, um, the sit-down production of the Los Angeles Company of the Phantom of the Opera. And I found that out. And I was like, oh, if he can do it, I can do it. You know, because he looked just like me and he had dark skin like me. And that was a big thing for me because it was like, you know, there's there's a lot of colorism even within the community, you know, and like, you know, lighter is better, darker is worse and stuff like that. And so when Wesley, I would see Wesley Snipes on TV, television film actor, I would see people like you, know, Robert Guillaume on TV and they were dark skin like me because I had this thing of like, you're not going to see me if I, because of my skin color, like, you know, you, that, that is in your head. And, uh, but I said, if Robert Guillaume could be the phantom in the phantom of the opera, then I could be the phantom in the phantom of the opera. And, uh, so yeah, that, that's where it started. That is so powerful. And I, I did not know that Robert Guillaume was the phantom. I knew Norm Lewis was the phantom on Broadway, but I didn't know that someone had preceded him. Yeah, you know, and it's funny, I'm friends with Norm. And um, when I found that out, um, I, you know, I made sure and bought my ticket, I bought like a really expensive ticket. And I sat in like the fourth row. And, you know, and I watched him be the phantom. It's, it's, it's still, you know, it's my favorite show. 
because it's it started it, you know. So I'll be the Phantom one day. Just who knows? I mean, maybe the Phantom in Sydney. I was about to ask: Is that a dream role for you? (laughs) Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I must have seen the Phantom over seventeen times, and um, my favorite Phantom is a guy named um, um, I can't remember his first name, but his last name is Hislop. I think it's Michael Hislop or something, or High Slip or H Y S L O P. I was on tour with Fame the Musical in Toronto, and I saw this phantom, and he was so physical. He was crawling on the floor, and I said, that's the kind of phantom I'm going to be. That's the kind of phantom. And I waited by the stage door, and I told him, you know, like, you were so physical. Like, like that's, you know, that's that, that, that encapsulated the kind of, like, I, I, I saw myself in the physicality with, with, with Mr. Hislop. Yeah. And with your dance training, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So yeah. it started with, what was your teacher's name in elementary school? Miss Cheryl Verne Shepard. Miss <laughs> mm-hmm. Shepard. What kind yeah. of training did you receive with her? Well, uh, you know, we, it was ballet class, you know, but we, we um, you know, because that's the basics, that's where you start. But, you know, we had, there was a dance concert every year, every fall and every spring. Well, the fall was like a uh, like a like a fashion show, but it had lots of dance in it. But the spring there was a dance dance show, and then there was a musical. So all we would do like like we would you know learn the basics and and and, and learn jazz and stuff like that. But but Beth definitely in the uh, she also had a dance school too that I went to starting at around like age eleven or twelve. You know we had dance classes from the first grade. And then you you got to pick your major in the seventh and eighth grade, and so I picked dance as my major. But I was in the choirs, and I was in and I was you know playing the leads in the play. So really, jack of all trades. Definitely ballet was first, and then I moved into the jazz world. As you know, that's that's where you know the songs were. <laughs> so you were triple threat from very early on. Maybe you know, and we did, I didn't even know what that term was, but like you know, you wanted you just wanted to participate. You know, you wanted to do it all. And, you know, it was just something that like, you know, that was that was really ushered into, like like poured into just kind of whatever you'd like to do, you know. And there were some fights. There were some fights. He can't be in the choir because he got dance class, you know, like all of that. And, you know, and then me skipping out on dance rehearsal because I had to sing, you know, like. So, you know, it, it, it's always been a juggle of, of, of time. But I've always been interested. And and here's the thing. I was not very good. <laughs> this I, I do not I, believe. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, no. I just wanted it really bad. And I had very, very, very talented friends. Like uh, Cheryl's, uh, Miss Shepard's son is a guy named Chaz Shepard. And Chaz was like a child star. Like he was on sitcoms. He did lots of commercials. He was on Star Search. Remember Star Search? You know, like he won Star Search. Like, like he was like very, very, very talented singer. And, you know, so like I, you know, I would hang around with him. He's my friend. And like, so I had lots of, and like I grew up during Boys to Men. We all came from Philadelphia. So those were the people that were four or five years ahead of me. So you were looking at those type of people, you know, and I, you know, I couldn't even touch my toes first dance class, but I just really wanted to do it, you know, and the voice didn't come along until later on. But, you know, but I was I was singing with that a cast album, you know, screaming out those notes, you know, just working, working day and night. My mother would go, James, you shut up. You didn't, you didn't get that part yet. You shut up. It's 10 o'clock at night. Shut up. <laughs> now go cuz I'd re- I'd rewind it over and over again and sing the same part over you know cuz I was practicing. What cast albums were you listening to? Oh my goodness. Well, it was The Phantom of the Opera. Um uh, what else? I had a um do you you know Forbidden Broadway? I, I there were there were movie musicals that I knew nothing about, but I knew the Forbidden Broadway <laughs> version of them. Like um like I, I, uh, like when they made fun of a. Uh, I didn't listen to Les Mis, but um, but they made fun of um, uh, uh what's the song? Uh, at, uh, at the end of the day, we're songs, another older. <laughs> not that one, but this uh, this song's too hard. It's so too hard, and then he goes, "It's too 
<laughs> like I knew that, and um, which um, which which, which the, the the Julie Andrews one? It was uh, about um, I it was I could have danced all night, but it was like I could have sing the no- or like I could have changed the key. Da, 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 da. <laughs> I didn't listen to those songs because, and here's the thing: I didn't. I knew about the Phantom because I went, but I I really listened to things that looked like me. Like, so I had Dream Girls, I had The Wiz, I, you know, I really needed to see me or to hear me. And I was not like an R&B singer. Like, that was not my ministry. Like, I, I was not in anybody's church or anything like that. But it was so important. The representation was so important to me even then, because mm-hmm. these people look like me, you know. So um, those are a few albums that I had. How did you come across Forbidden Broadway if you weren't really into like show tunes? How I did that come into your world? I do not even know. I, d- I don't even know. I mean, I had a cassette tape. <laughs> there you go. And and I had a Walkman and that was in my Walkman. I see myself walking down Fifth Street with my Walkman <laughs> with like at the corner of Fifth and um, Wolf with like rewinding. I could have danced or whatever that song was, whatever the parody was. Um, the name of the parody, but um, which ends with Julie Jazz Hot. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I didn't know. I didn't know what that was about. I didn't know what that was about. <laughs> like, but I had all. I had those and bought for Ben Broadway too. Like, you know. But I don't even know. I mean, there was Tower Records. It might have just been like perusing the, you know, and like what was cheapest. Like, you know, that's probably what was the honest. You know, like, oh, that's musical theater. You know, let me just grab that. It's probably four bucks. You know, I can buy that now and listen to, you know, Dream and Dream. That's so funny. I I came across Forbidden Broadway when I was in college and a friend was like, you need to know this show. And by then it was like, uh, I think the first one I listened to was like edition 19 or something. (laughs) It was like... um, SVU special special victims uh, unit and but now I've listened like volume one through 21 yeah. and that's like how uh, I learned Broadway history <laughs> was through Forbidden Broadway it's really I mean it's it's well speaking of Broadway history I did wasn't you know my, I had a friend grandma I knew about church but we didn't go to church how I learned about the New Testament was Jesus Christ Superstar <laughs> I did not. I did not read the Bible until I saw a touring. Oh, now, now, this was amazing. I got to tell you this. I was in. We were in high school, and my friend Joe Sacco. Oh no, no. Um, my friend Chaz. And then I went again with Joe Sacco. But Chaz, his mother, Cheryl Shepard. She was like, she bought us tickets to see Jesus Christ Superstar, and we were young. We were like twelve or something. And um, she was like, I think you're gonna like this. And we snuck backstage. We were at the stage door, and 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 the the stage man, the stage door guy was like, "Why don't you go back inside?" Like it was cold, so he was like, he brought us in, and we were like right at the door. And Carl Anderson, <laughs> he was into meditation. He was a little bit of a a kookity kook, and not the meditation part, but just generally a kookity kook. And um, he, but that they. Louisa, these people were singing so well. And and Carl Anderson had just gotten back from vacation. Honey, that voice? <laughs> it was ridiculous. But, it, but, it, but they know Carl Anderson and, and what's the what's the Jesus' name? Um, Ted somebody. Ted Ted Ted. Ted Ted. Ted. Let's call him Ted. Well, his name is Ted, but I can't remember his last name. But um, they they know it so well that they backphrase like two, it's like two, it's like measures later that the harmony has changed. Like they're just singing whatever they want to sing, and they sang the shit out of that score. Like it, Carl Anderson. I mean, he's no longer with us, but but so so it was amazing. But I I, I was like, I'm reading this Bible because. <laughs> like, Cause it's like, cause this is, this is, I like this. He, they sang that, they sang that, sang that. And then um, Ted, Ted, Carl Anderson was like, oh, you know, come into my dressing room. So we went up to the dressing room and he was like, look what I can do. And he was like, he moved his eyes really, <laughs> he moved his eyes back and forth. Like, and his eyes could go. I was like, he's like, 
He's like, like not human. This is a magical person. He this sings like an angel person. and his eyes quiver. Yeah. And he's Judas. Like, <laughs> so, so it was, it was, it was really intense. And, and like, you know, and then I was on that cause I had, my godparents had the cast album. And like like the concept album, the Angela or Weber with like all the people that you don't know, and like you know, it was it's great music, but like they weren't singing it like Ted and Carl, like they were just they were singing it, but they weren't singing it, you know. So um, you know, musical theater has always been a part of my life, and you know, but to, to come back to this, I don't know where Forbidden Broadway came from. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, did you ever, as growing up in Philadelphia, were you watching like either filmed musicals or movie musicals on TV or on VHS? Well, yeah, I, you know, what was big was the, the is the reason why I'm here really is, is, um, you know, Greg Burge is Richie Walters. That filming of, of A Chorus Line, I used to watch it like this, Louisa. Just for listeners, James is like yes. right in... <laughs> His eyes are right up to the camera. <laughs> right, right, like like inches from from the screen. And and watching Greg Burgess, Richie Walters in that filmed version of A Chorus Line is like watching magic. It is like watching magic. And Blockbuster Video had musicals, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I I I I, I saw the film version of Sweeney Todd. I didn't know what the hell was going on. The but I was like, um I'm Angela Lansbury, it. George Hearn. Yes, yes. Angela Lansbury, uh, Angela Lansbury, Lynn Cariou. Oh. Yes, yes. He did the filmed version. Um, and, um, and I was like, what is happening? They're chopping people up, but I love it. You know, why is that guy singing so high? You know, like, I mean, it was, you know, the Mr. Pirelli, Senor Pirelli. I was just in love. And, um, you know, and I picked up the chorus line from there. And it's so funny because... When I later, like the first chorus line that I did was like, I think I was in, I was like 15 in, in like a sophomore in high school. And like, we got, we get to rehearsal. It's, it was like a chorus line in Delaware at the Candlelight Dinner Theater. And I didn't know anything about doing anything like that. And we get to rehearsal and they're like, okay, we're going to do your part tomorrow. I was like, okay. I get there and they're like, give me the ball, give me the ball. I'm like, give me the ball. What's, what's give me the ball? They're like. Oh, you've been listening to the film. Surprise is on the film. And I later learned that surprise was written because um, um I'm blanking on everybody's name right now. Um, the, the writer of a course. Marvin line, Hamlish. Marvin Hamlish. Yeesh. Marvin Hamlish. It's funny. I was listening to a Katie Huffman um, podcast today and she was doing the same thing I was doing. She's like, uh, uh, people it's called are. pandemic brain and pandemic end, brain. Of brain. <laughs> end of the day brain. Yes. I'll take, I'll take that. Um, Marvin Hamlish didn't write, give me the ball. Like that wasn't his thing. Like he didn't like, because uh, the story goes is that Michael Bennett, they, they weren't, they weren't finding a song for, for Richie. They had some other things. And then Ron Dennis was a big Aretha Franklin fan. And Michael Bennett was like, well, what we're doing is not working. So Ron, just think of something. And Ron was like, well, give me the ball, give me the ball, give me the ball, give me the ball, yeah! Give me the ball, give me the ball, give me the ball, yeah! And like, they put like a little melody under it. So as And Marvin Hamlish, that was always his, the bane of his existence. So when they were doing the film, he was like, I'm writing a new song. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Yeah. See, I grew up listening to the cassette of A Chorus Line, which okay. side A finished right before Music in the Mirror and side B was like eight <laughs> minutes of Music in the Mirror. Um, <laughs> and I like, I as a kid, I didn't understand the significance of that song. And so I fast yes. forward it because I thought it was boring. <laughs> Stupid yes. young me. Um, but I have chills thinking about 15 year old you singing that and then cut to, I don't know how old you are in London and I didn't know you yet. And I happened to see you play that role in London. Like, I feel very reclaimed thinking about like that. <laughs> the journey that happened in between is quite extraordinary. Yes, yes, yes. It has been. It has been. Mm. Wow. Oh, that's so powerful. And given <laughs> also for me, it's extra special because A Chorus Line was the very first musical I saw live when oh, I was wow. 10 years old and I oh. remember the lights going out and I freaked out and I grabbed my mom's hand because it went to the blackout and then da da yes. da da da, da. Oh. and like to this I st I'm getting like 
my heart is racing just thinking about it. Like that's like over 25 years ago. (laughs) (laughs) And it's that show, like, even though I was a 10 year old kid in Sydney, like how much of that show resonated with me. I wasn't a Broadway dancer. (laughs) I'm still not a Broadway dancer, but it's so, it's so specific. It's so universal. Yeah. It's so universal. And it's, it's, it's the show is the spirit of the artist. You know, it, it, it's th- these are the things we do. We sing it as an act, but it's speaking to the spirit, the kind of spirit you, who, who the artist is. That's why. That's that's really why. You know, and let me tell you, I could be I could be listening to it or or, or looking at a production, and like my heart still goes like uh, when I hear bum 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 because it's like <laughs> the fear of God. It was like, oh my God, here we go. <laughs> like, <laughs> doesn't matter and i've done a chorus line a lot and like it's still like oh shit (laughs) here we go there's no getting off this train (laughs) oh that is that just like my heart is pounding thinking about it (laughs) having never done it myself i have danced many a time in my living room (laughs) Uh, but uh. never on the stage um so that is a perfect uh segue the spirit of the artist um, to lead us into um, Triple Threat. So I understand you were in London um, working on the Scottsboro Boys when you started working on the first iteration of Triple Threat? Yeah, you know, I, um, you know, in all of my um, boldness and cor- courage, you know, uh, David Land, the, artist- the, uh, the then artistic director of the Young Vic in London, I asked for a meeting with David Land. And I had an idea about a Sammy Davis Jr. show. And um, because that's what I thought people wanted. And David Land, um, you know, first I got to say, the Young Vic is absolutely amazing. And um, they have these, like, nobody has a real office. They, like, they have open space plans. So you, like, if you want some privacy, you go down into the cafe in the middle of the thing and have a talk. Like, it's not, like, no, people don't have offices. It's pretty just open. And um, David Land was like, you know, let's let's have some tea. And uh, cause all about tea there. And uh, <laughs> um, he, uh, he, I pitched to him, you know, this uh, Sammy Davis Jr. And he said to me, he said, James, he said, I, you know, I love Sammy Davis Jr. He said, but what we love you. He said, I'm interested in what your story, what you would do. Do you write? Do you, he was like, we're interested in you, not Sammy Davis Jr. I'd never heard that before in my life. You know, we're interested in you. What do you have? And I was like, uh, no, I don't write. And he's like, well, write something. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So I started to write a little bit. And I just started writing these stories about, you know, I, I'm, I, I, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm in uh, recovery. And, uh, uh, and I started writing these stories about my journey um, out there in the streets. And, and I would just send him little stories. And he would look at the stories and he'd be like, that's you? He's like, that's not the person that I see and that I'm looking at. He's like, I can't believe that's happened to you. Write more, write more, write more. And finally, I, ke- I just kept writing. And by the end of our stay in London that time, um, was, it was February 2015, I had like a 21-page narrative. And it was just a narrative of me kind of writing and, sh- and just telling my story of my time of abusing, abusing drugs and alcohol. And I had Coleman Domingo and Forrest McClendon who were – the stars of, of the Scottsboro Boys, I had them read it aloud to me and they laughed and stuff like that. So they were actually my first, you know, Coleman Domingo is now in, you know, Fear the Walking Dead and, and, and doing all this wonderful stuff and, and directing and, and, and you know, he's it, it, just amazing. And Forrest McClendon is a wonderful teacher and still performs. But um, having these titans read my stuff for the first time aloud was very powerful. And then about, we left London, February 2015, and then by April or May, Around this time, actually, I get an uh, email from David Land. He's like, we'd like to offer you a commission. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Um, having no idea what a commission <laughs> is or what you do or like. And then he said, but, you know, you are, you know, you are just new at this. So so they asked um, David Thompson, who is the book writer for the Scottsboro Boys and Chicago, the musical, the revival and many Broadway shows, if he would kind of guide me through the writing process of, of, of writing something. And, um, and so, so that's what he did. So it was like for two years, basically I worked with David Thompson and 
it was basically like being now I never finished college. I never finished college, but it was really like being in grad school for writing, working with David Thompson, you know, playwriting and and um and it was amazing. And he really pushed me to be creative, to explore, and it turned this narrative turned into a play, and it was like to like 12 characters in different scenes and being creative and lots of imagination. And then <clears throat> David Land left the Young Vic and artistic directorship changed and the whole regime changed. And there were a few moments at which like we could have went forward at the Young Vic, but we just weren't in a position to really seize those moments. Like, um, like we were still working on the script and what we wanted to do and like there was like a, a couple of fits and starts and stops. And so the new artistic directorship was like, thank you very much. And I was very sad about that. But what it did was I gained control of the rights to my work. And um, so around 2018, uh, you know, I just started working with a, 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 a producer in London, trying to get a workshop somewhere in London. And then that just didn't even work out at all. You know, flash forward to 2019, I kind of like let London go or or not let London go. I just said, this is what I'm going to do here in the States. <laughs> That's what I said. And um, and so I just was like knocking on doors and doing things and, and, and just trying to like see if anybody was interested. I asked a lot of questions to Susan Stroman and David Thompson. David Thompson, you know, like left it with the young Vic, basically. That's what his attachment. He's like, I love you, but you're on your own. And um and so uh you know I shipped it to people and nobody was interested. And um and to be fair, it didn't even look like a play yet. You know, like I didn't know what it was. It's still I didn't even have final draft on my computer. So it didn't even look like a play. I didn't really know these things. And um, but what happened was um, when I went, I went out to Drury Lane to play Bert and Mary Poppins. Oh, well, no, I should back up a little bit. Should back up a little bit. When I was in, I was doing Guys and Dolls in in Norfolk, Virginia, and the music director of Guys and Dolls was the artistic director of a theater called the Ziders American Dream Theater, and he said, James, he was like, we've, I've got, I'm the artistic director of this theater on a, on a day off, come and take a look at our theater. We do new works and stuff. So I was like, okay, well, it's my day off. <laughs> so I go down there and I'm looking at this theater and I'm like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It's new. Um, the state of the art, and he, and, uh, Bart Keebler picked every bolt and nut and speaker and projection and stage dimensions. Like he, they built it from the ground up. And um, on the ride back, I said, I have this play that I've been like working on. And I, and I kind of pitched it to him. And Bart was like, oh, that sounds really interesting. Just send me what you have. And so I sent him an email and didn't hear anything. I go to Chicago, Illinois to do play Bert and Mary Poppins. And it was a very creative time for me. Um, the place where I was staying had like a solarium in the apartment. And so I spent a lot of nights, and I'm not even a night owl, as you know, like, but I spent a lot of nights creating stuff. Like I was like working on my tap in the solarium. I, was, I, would, I, I would say sneak down the stage, but it's not sneaking. I literally was like, hey, I'm going to go down and work out some stuff on the stage. So I was on the stage of the Drury Lane stage at midnight, working out some things, you know, playing with the ghosts, seeing shadows and just being at home, I was like, I kept reminding myself, like, this is my home. This is my sacred space. I have nothing to fear here. I lit, and the, the apartment was above the stage, so I literally lived in the theater. So it was a, it's an amazing apartment. But I, you know, I was working on like some like audition material. I just, it was, it was, it was, it was a real creative soul feeding time. And then I pulled out my play. And I started working on that. And then I I, I, I I sent a note around to the cast and some people in Chicago. And I was like, I'm just going to read this aloud if anybody wants to come. And nobody came, Louisa. For, and like uh, that day, like you could just see like it was like 13, 12, 10, 9, 7, 2, 1. Nobody's coming. And I sat there with my play. And I said, and, I, and then I turned on the um, recorder, 
and I read the play aloud by myself. And here's the thing. Before I did that, life was one way. After I did that, I knew something different about myself. Because what and what I found out was that artistry needs to happen whether people are looking or they're not looking. What's in you needs to come out whether you have an audience or you don't. I would not have known that if I did not do that. I'm so teary. That is so beautiful. And what a, sh- what a shift to like show up for yourself in that way. It's so brave. And so it just, it speaks to like what you, you know, the artist within that you, you just had to do it. You know, even if no one showed up, you still, you showed up. I showed up and, 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 and I cried and I turned on the music really loud. Cause I'm literally the only one in the building. And I, I had a little dance party. I, I turned the music up way loud. I danced in the solarium in my socks. And I, I, found, so I found new ground. I found a new space. And, um, and then interestingly enough, I had another reading and then like seven or eight people came. And I read it aloud and I, and I, and I recorded it. I video recorded it. And I sound designed it. And I, and I bought a little projector from Amazon. And so pictures would show up behind me. And there were pictures of my neighborhood, pictures of my using, conceptual pictures. All, like I designed it. I got a lot of help from the, st- the sound person at the Drury Lane Theater. And then um, and I filmed it on my iPhone. And I sent that to like 200 people. No, and But I also sent it to Bart Keebler from the, um, from the Ziders. And he was like, oh, now I see what you mean. <laughs> he was like, oh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Crickets. Um, so, but I, but I, I needed all that time. So uh, that was December, March. I'm in Chicago. The pandemic happens. And then, uh, you know, and then we're in that. And then May of 2020, I get a, I get an email from Bart and he said, you know, that play that you, uh, he's like, I think it would be perfect for us to do coming out of the pandemic. And I was like, are you kidding me? I was like, 99.9% of, of my, my industry is not working. And I get to work on a pl- play that I wrote. And so I, I didn't sleep for two days because I was like, like this in my bed. Like. <laughs> and then I emailed him. I actually emailed him and said, are you really for real? Like, you're not just playing. And he was like, yes, James, we're for real. I really emailed him. And I was like, I, are you kidding? Are you just like blowing smoke? And he was like, no, we're for real, serious. So that was in May, July. I I I um started working on the script, and then um, and then I picked a um, director and a choreographer, Kenny Ingram, who I've known in 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 um in New York City, and uh, we started working on the script in late July over Zoom, and uh, for a month we did that. We worked on the script, and and it turned into a play. I bought Final Draft. <laughs> it was like my big investment. You are professional now. <laughs> yes. And I was like, oh, now I see what people are doing. Oh, like, wow. Wow. Like, now this is for real. And I copyrighted all of the stuff, all of the everything, you know, sent it away and got a copyright and joined the Writers Guild of America, you know, all of that stuff. And then in late August or September, like I think, we went into the rehearsal room and started rehearsing Triple Threat. And I changed the title uh, over the summer to Triple Threat. I can't, I can't remember how I made that connection, but I, I, I it, it just, it, it happened. And, um, and so we went into the rehearsal studio. Me, Kenny Ingram, and, um, and Shaq, uh, a, an actor. And we, you know, he volunteered to be our stage manager. And, um, you know, it was us three, September, October, November, and December, working, working. We gave ourselves our own workshop. And um, and then in December, like the second week of December, Bart zoomed in because everybody could zoom in because we were near, you know, you could zoom into the rehearsal. And um, and then like one on a Friday, he, it was Bart zoomed in and my agent and i was like oh this don't look good and he said yeah we have to cancel it because of the numbers in virginia beach we can't bring you down 
you know, because of the numbers. And I, you know, I, I coined this phrase to like, I sad understand. <laughs> I sad understand. And so um, I did not, I was heartbroken. I was embarrassed. You know, I had a lot of feelings around it not going forward, you know. And I had kind of forgotten the fact that like, I'm not in control of shit. I can make decisions, but I'm not controlling anything. The, you know, there's there's a greater power that's that that has a bigger picture, and the bigger picture included me staying in New York City, you know, for the for the interim. So he said it's not canceled; it's delayed. And so I did not touch the script. Um, I did not touch the script the last two weeks in December. I needed a break. I did a lot of writing around that how I was feeling. And then I saw two things. I saw the fact that you, in, in January, that you uh, you wanted to do, um, you know, um, I'm blanking. The Artist Way. The Artist Way. And I literally, I hopped on that. And um, and I, I also saw that um, JWS, that acting school, um, Jen Waldman Studios, um, they 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 were going to be starting up in January, like like with this new and improved. They had been zooming all all the year, but like it just came on my radar, and so I enrolled myself in acting classes, and and you know in those you know in the writings of the artist way, you know I wrote a lot about what I was going through and all of that, and um and in the acting classes I worked out all of my char- I I used my own play in the acting classes as monologues and stuff Smart. so I, <laughs> I right but it did Louisa it didn't occur to me until literally I was like they were like and you should choose a monologue and I was like oh, I can use my own material <laughs> Did not, did not, no forethought in that at all. And so what I got to do was really, for the next three months, really dive into these individual characters. Another thing that happened was I talked to Bayork Lee, who is the original Connie of A Chorus Line. And I told her, my play was canceled. And she said to me, she, so she, she said, she said, your play was canceled because you wasn't ready to do your play. I said, what do you mean? And she said, she said, let me ask you this. She said, how many characters you play? I said, it's about 20. She said, do you have the beginning and the middle and end of character analysis of each character that you play? I said, uh, she said, you ain't ready to do your play. Mm-hmm. Boop. Face crack. <laughs> I had to pick up my face. So, so that's what I did in the beginning of January. I wrote character analyses. And she said, and she had, a, you know, the point was, you know, when, when, she said, when your play gets you know, picked up by, produced by Denzel Washington somewhere. Because you're the writer, you may, you may not want to do it. You may want, another actor may want you to do it so that there's no confusion about any of the characters that you play, that they play, you have character analyses of from beginning to middle to end. They have everything they need to produce your play. That's where you need to be thinking. I was like, oof. So that's what I did in January. And then, and then in February, Bart called <laughs> and he was like, your play is on. And I was like, are you serious? I'm ready I now. Was, I'm ready I'm, now. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. You know, but like I, I was ready and didn't even think that it was going to happen anytime soon. I, I had no indication of that. And, um, but it did. And, um, you know, um, and then we just started, we went back into rehearsal in March Oh uh, yeah, like March, the beginning of March, Kenny, Shaq, and I, and we picked up where we left off, you know, and um, and then we got, and then I went down into the Ziders uh, Theater in, down in Virginia Beach in April, April seventeen. We had about two weeks of rehearsal. I had one preview, and we did five performances. Now the reason why we did five performances is because, you know, we we knew that we would be making it into a teleplay, and we also knew that attendance would be something very low because we're coming out of a pandemic and you can only have a certain amount of people in the theater and people aren't coming to the theater like that yet. So we sold, you know, the tickets that we could. And, um, but we had, a we had 
uh, we filmed a teleplay that'll be out like early summer. And um, we had five cameras for each and every night. Wait, wait, wait. before you get to that, I'm I'm okay. so excited to talk about filming it because you know I'm okay. all about that. I'm so psyched. Re- I want to rewind a little bit. When you had that very first reading where no one showed up and it was just you, prior to that, was the play written as a play with multiple actors or was it always a one person play? No, it started as a narrative. It was never, I never, I never thought it would be a one man show. Like it was, I thought it was going to be a three person show. I had an idea of like three black men, you know, moving and, and playing these different characters you know, but I didn't think, I, oh, I would stay me, but they would play other people. And then it grew to like a 12 person play. I had readings in New York City with like seven or eight people playing different characters, my mom and my brother and this and that, and you know, and, and, and somebody reading me so I could hear the words. It didn't become a one person play until, uh, until Drury Lane. Hmm. Like like the end of 2019, it didn't it didn't until I started reading it aloud and I was like, oh okay, okay this is gonna be something else, but you know but here we go. And I'm curious, given your skills and the fact that it's called Triple Threat, how come it's a play that sings and dances and not a musical? Well, because well, the, I'm not busting out and singing a whole bunch of songs, you know, like that's not, that's not, that wasn't the, the point. The point was it was going to be a play. And, um, but because it centers around Broadway so much, what I've done with one song, it's a song on Broadway, George Benson's on Broadway. I've deconstructed it. Like I've, I've, I've just the baseline you hear sometimes um i i i open i open the play dancing to that music and i sing a little lick there um when i land in new york i sing the first verse you know um when i'm getting hired and this is a real story i was a i was i was uh, i was about to say i was auditioning i was i was applying to be a waiter in in a, in, a, in a restaurant called avenue bistro the second week the week after september 11th I went to try to try to find a waitressing job, a wait a waitressing job, yeah, and um, and um, and the, the the manager looked at me. He was like, "What are you like, an actor or something?" And I was like, "You know, I'm a, a musical theater performer." And he was like, "Well, sing something," and I was like, and I let out like a, a note. I was like, ah! and and he was like, "You're hired." I, Louisa, Louisa. It was, it was like, I think I'm gonna like it here. Like, it's like the most musical coming to New York thing to have ever happened to anybody in real life. Like, that was my life. Three so, bucks, two bags, one me. You know, so in the play, I've, I've, I've used that moment. And instead of just letting out a note, I sing the second verse of on Broadway. And then at the end of the play, when I tie it all up and then there's like an epilogue, I sing the third verse. So that's how I use song. But like the movement and the music you hear is 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 always reminding you of that on Broadway song. And the blood of the play is movement. So like, you know, how like Curious Incident moves, you know, patterns and um you know and i use voiceover as music too so like i'm dancing kind of like dance concerty modern to to voiceover you know mm-hmm. so like that's how we use movement so I, I i was like i was like well what do we call this i was like it's not a musical it's not a dance concert it's not it's not a um it's not like a stand and deliver like you know concert vo- singing concert and i was like well it's a play that moves and sings <laughs> it's its own genre <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah yes okay so let's go back to filming it my understanding is that the zyder is was set up from the beginning when they built it to film shows yeah yeah no they've got the state of the art system you know they they built they built all of that stuff in house you know where you can you can do all of that stuff they've got people on staff that are that are versed in that so so you know it it was it's literally this project 
was made for the Ziders American Dream Theater. You know, they have like projection people on staff, like because I use a lot of projection, you know, and sound design, you know, so there are people who actually make and design that type of stuff. So and 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 then I pressed it, you know, like because because a lot of the things that I had imagined had never been that really explored before, you know. So so everybody was really working around the clock. Oh, that must have been so exciting to have the things that were inside your head become reality. Louisa, <laughs> it is everything, and, and and just a little insight to me, you know. I told you, I'm, I'm you know, like not, a, a lot of the time what speaks into my soul like 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 when i do something like there's a little voice that says to me well that's not going to be enough and i'm not saying like my effort i'm saying like it's not going to fulfill me like like you know that's that's part of the disease that i have it like it knocks and says like that's not going to be enough i was from performing at carnegie hall it's it's you know like as a you know i i worked with the pops you know applause and the little voice goes that's not enough and I'm and like now, I mean, I it doesn't get me down. It's it's just what happens inside of me. I, I, that's just the way that I'm built. Not one time during my whole time at the Ziders American Dream Theater did I ever hear that voice. Not one time. And and now that I know that, it's it's hard for me to do anything else. But that, yeah, it, it's it's hard. But it makes it. You, um, they they asked me to. Um, I got a call, an uh, email recently asking me if I wanted to um, go back into the ensemble of Chicago the Musical. I said absolutely not. I said I would look forward to the time that um, I'm asked to play uh, Billy Flynn. And in in the next email was said. So so you're saying that you do you you. You you would literally it was like they weren't hearing me. You would you would do an ensemble track um, and understudy Billy Flynn, or you won't do anything but Billy Flynn. I said it's the latter. It said I I'm go, you know I look forward to the contract of of being cast as Billy Flynn, you know, and I'm also going to be playing Billy Flynn at the Muni this summer, you know. So so it it makes the nose easier because i know where i want to go mm. yeah yeah it 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 really makes the nose easier oh that's so which powerful. is a strange thing strange thing strange thing mm. i guess cuz when you know you know <laughs> you you know in your heart that's and what what an amazing gift to have i i know it has taken a very long time and many bumps and many many things in the road to get to that point, yeah. but what, what a gift to have it now. Yeah. An absolute gift, absolute gift. And so I am excited for the gift of your show that will, we will get to see very soon. So you said it was filmed mm -hmm. with five cameras. So we had five cameras filming each show. So I wanted, and, and we took two afternoons to do like follows and close ups and, 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 and you know, so, I've, especially with what's happening <clears throat> with, um, you know, like filming musicals and filming things uh, coming out of this pandemic, this will be, um, you know, a really, really wonderful, wonderful version of Triple Threat. It is, it is going to be inter not, not interactive, but it's going to feel like you're there, you know, because we are, we're really going for it. You know, the Z has really, really, really pulled out all the stops and, and um, I saw a peak of the raw footage, and I was overjoyed at what I saw. Oh, it's I can't I cannot wait. Are you part of wait. editing it? I am. I am. That's that's you know you know it's it's I stayed down there for a little bit to um, kind of discuss the videographer. You know, was on board. You know, like right. You know, uh, pre all throughout Vashit, my heat. Is that how I say her name? Yeah, Vashit. Yeah. And, um, you know, she's, she's fantastic and, and she's wonderful in her own stuff. And, um, you know, so we've, we've gotten powwows and what will happen over the next, uh, you know, few weeks is that, um, she will send me cuts and I, well, I, I have a wide angle, um, um, you know, viewing of the show and what we will do 
starting on Monday is I will, I, she already knows where, what things that I want to see, um, shots and angles that I want to see, but the process will be, she will, you know, put it together and I will say, I want it from this angle. I want it from that angle or, you know, what does it look like from this angle? So that's, that's basically the process, you know, and, and, and with the sound design and projections, I've never seen anything like this. I've, I mean, with, with what they've done in projection, ah, ah, I'm so excited. So excited. I am so excited too. <laughs> I cannot wait to see it. Do you know where it's going to be released yet? No, I mean, well, first it'll be available through the Ziders uh, website. You know, that's, that's, that's the main, cause they get first crack at it, but you know, I want to see it everywhere. You know, I really, really want to see it go to places, you know. Amazon, Netflix, everywhere. Yeah, I was about to say the next Netflix special. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, I want the brass ring. I want it all. <laughs> yes. And, and you deserve it. Um, Thank you. Oh, James, this has been so delightful. My heart is so full of <laughs> learning more about your story. And I cannot way to see triple threat we will i will post information everywhere as soon as it's available so i have some quick questions that i ask all my guests you don't need to think about it too much there are no wrong answers first up okay. what is your favorite musical oh the phantom of the opera i had a feeling you were gonna say that <laughs> cannot wait to hear your music of the night uh yes. do you have a favorite filmed live musical oh goodness um you know, I really like that Jesus Christ Superstar that they did um, recently. The NBC. Um, yeah, with, with Brandon Victor Dixon. Mm -hmm. I really, really, really enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, I loved that production. It was gorgeous. Yeah. A film, you were calling it a teleplay earlier. So uh, mm -hmm. we have a stage show and then um, the film of that stage show. It's not really live theater, but it's not exactly a film either. So what should we call it? Well, I've been calling it a teleplay mm -hmm. because I mean, because it's, 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 it's happening in a theater. It's a play, you know, and, um, you know, and with the, uh, the intimacy of, of the camera angles and all of that stuff, you know, we, we, we don't pretend like it's not a play, you know, so a teleplay. A teleplay. <laughs> I like it. Uh, where do you stand on bootlegs? Hey, look, get it out there get it out there. I mean, support your artists, support everybody, you know, that'll happen. But like, I, you know, like I, I know I got a few. <laughs> <laughs> it's how we learn. You know, that's it. What uh, live theater or live musicals do you wish had been filmed? Oh goodness. Um, huh. Wish had been filmed. Oh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I would have loved to have seen the Scottsboro Boys, you know, that wasn't filmed, you know, I would have loved to have kind of like watch what that happens. I mean, we've got a commercial, but like, I, I would have loved to have seen that journey, you know. Was um, it filmed for Lincoln Center for the archives? Yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it was, but like, you know, like, oh, I want to see like a, you know, a pro shot, <laughs> not just the wide angle, you know, like, <laughs> um, Oh gosh, yeah. No, no, that's 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 one. I mean, it's one that I've been in, of course. But um, yeah, which 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 um, what else? No, no, nothing else is jumping out at me. No, that's yeah. good. I I would also like to see that one. I it's one. I think I arrived after it was on Broadway, so I mm -hmm. I never got to see it. Yeah. What would you like to see filmed in the future? Oh goodness, you know, I mean. I'm, you know, Louisa, I'm interested in seeing what comes out of this pandemic. I'm interested in seeing diverse stories. I want some, I want some queer stuff up there. You know, I want to see, I, I want to see, uh, what's the, what's the one in Michael Jackson, the strange loop, you know, I want to see that filmed, you know, um, I just want to see some different voices, you know, up, up there and, and filmed and, 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 and the, what, what I loved about film things is that it can reach people, you know, people in obscure places, you know, can see what it looks like mm -hmm. and um, not just living in this uh, or waiting to the 10th anniversary of the Phantom or the, the, the lame, you know, like 
you know, like, uh, so they can get into their hot little hands and like see people that look like them, you know. Uh, you just reminded me of a question I wanted to ask earlier. What would you say to other performers or writers who are hesitant to film their work and get it out there on on camera? Well, you have to ask yourself why you're hesitant or, and ask yourself why you're an artist. Because, um, you know, like like I like I figured that out, you know, um, in, in, in Drury Lane, you know, art is, you know, it's it needs to be done. It needs to be done. And it needs, and it's, it's how we relate. It's how, it's how we learn. It's how we share, you know, if you, if you are to be successful, you you are to be successful. It doesn't matter if there's a bootleg out there or not, you know, like, like, like if people want it, they want it, you know? And, um, you know, so I just encourage you to share it, you know, it's meant to be shared, you know, it ain't yours anyway. <laughs> Perfect. I love that. <laughs> Where can we find you online? Uh, at James T. Lane on Instagram. That's 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 the best place to do it. Or you can um, send me an email at www.jamestlane.com. You can do it that way. Those are the places. At James T. Lane on, on Twitter. Fabulous. Thank you again so much, James. This has been so much fun. Yes, it has. <laughs> <laughs> Filmed Live Musicals makes musical theater more accessible, brings joy, and creates a sense of connection for audiences around the world. With thanks to patrons Josh Brandon, Elliot Charles, Rachel Esteban, Mercedes Esteban Lyons, James T. Lane, Al Monaco, David Negrin, Jesse Rabinowitz and Brenda Goodman, David and Catherine Rabinowitz, and Beck Twist for being a part of spreading the love of musical theater. If you would like to join us, you can do so by becoming a Filmed Live Musicals patron. For as little as $3 a month, you'll receive early access to the Filmed Live Musicals podcast, early access to site content, and a weekly newsletter with info on upcoming streams. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please like and review on your podcast app. You can find us on Twitter at Musicals on Screen, on Facebook at Filmed Live Musicals, and you can visit the site at www.filmedlivemusicals.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.